Alright, so good morning. My name is Gabriel. Uh, this is joint work with the uh, the head term problems for the Up there. No. It has to be pointing out otherwise. Oh, there we go. They can turn the head in here. So my name is Gabriel. This is joint work with Ludovic, uh, Nicolas, Mathieu, and Patrick from our lab in Paris, uh, Lucis. And today's uh, talk, like I said, is sequentially generated instance dependent image representations for classification. So it's kind of helpful. Uh, so we'll go through, start off by trying to what that's about. So the point here is to sequentially generate image representations uh, that are well adapted for classification. And so this is sort of a different vision of representations than what you get in terms of related representation. I'm just going to hold this. And so the goal here is that you're going to be able to have a classifier that not only learns to classify images, but learns to acquire the information on its own. And so here you have an example with a cow and a dog. And so what you have at first, the classifier has no prior information. And so it's learned, so, so the images are pre-cut into 16 zones in, in all, this, uh, all these examples and, uh, and experiments. And so it first has no information, and it's learned that information is most likely present in the bottom right central square. So it asks uh, to see that information. Once it receives that information, it's able to leverage it to make a second decision. Since the first piece of information isn't really all that discriminating, it goes down, tries to get more information. And once this additional information is there, it's able to kind of branch off and follow what it believes is going to be the best path to acquire the information that's going to help it classify correctly. And so this is just you know, a, a simulated example. It's not a bad example from the training set. But we can see that the idea is that it would maybe follow the cow's body to, to see that there's a cow and follow the dog's pose to see that it's a dog without actually having to consider all the information present in the image. And so the information acquisition here is not only sequential, which means it goes step by step, but it's also adaptive. So each new image being inferred upon is going to have a different path that the classifier follows that corresponds to the best path for it to be able to acquire information. And so what we call the final representation here isn't any sort of latent representation, but it's actually just what information was used by the classifier to classify. And so this is part of a bigger framework that we worked on in my thesis that we call sequential classification where we model classification as a sequential process. And the goal here is that not only do we learn how to classify, we also learn how to acquire the information necessary to classify. And uh, kind of the two tricks is that as we uh, acquire the information, we can leverage all this additional information so that the end of our, class, the end of our acquisition trace for our acquisition task gets better and better because we have more and more context to know what we should be looking at. Additionally, since this classification process is explicitly existent, we can constrain it during tasks to maybe implement some sort of budget or other constraint. So in this particular test, we actually have a fixed budget, and we don't constrain the acquisition at all, but it's definitely something that's possible. So there's a couple of advantages to this sort of approach for images. First of all, it's an efficient use of information. So if we're not allowed to look at all the information, we're going to use it efficiently. Um, additionally, we'll see that in some cases, we have an ability to ignore noisy regions. So we're going to be able to actually classify better on some data sets, because we're not going to be looking at the whole image, but only looking at the important regions for classification. And of course, if we have some sort of uh, very heavy pro processing stage, we're going to be able to do faster inference. So in terms of applications, uh, one nice one is if you have a robot navigation task, and so you have a, a small opening for your camera, it's not a very wide field of view, and you want to have a localization, uh, for example, run. So you need to look around you, and you need to know which direction you're pointing your camera to better localize. And you don't want to you know, uh, just go over your whole, your whole possible set of uh, directions you're pointing your camera, because that takes way too long. Uh, additionally, if you have a very large image stream, and you want to be doing object detection inside this, uh, you're not going to want to convolve your whole image to do object detection. You're going to want to basically try to find out where is most, most likely the objects will appear, and additionally, if you've seen the first objects, kind of see where other objects might appear nearby. And then finally, the task we do here is just a more naive image classification task, where if you have a bunch of regions in your image and you want to be able to classify without using all the regions of the image, then you can classify a lot quite, uh, quicker and more efficiently using this kind of model. And so there's kind of two conceptual steps for this model. Uh, the first part is looking at information. So you're iteratively starting off with uh, new information, acquiring some of the information, leveraging that information to go acquire more information. And you do this you know, as many times as necessary. So in our case, we have a fixed budget, so that means you only do it B times. But you can also learn to do it more or less. And once you've acquired enough information, either because of an outside constraint or because you've learned that it's enough information, then you can choose to classify. And so these two steps can actually be uh, learned together in one uh, total process described by a markup decision process 
and solve that reinforcement learning, or at least finding some sort of good policy for reinforcement learning. So uh, there's kind of two big ways to represent the uh, state. We have this oh, the MVP, we have the states and the actions. And so the state here is uh, the set of regions represented by the local SIF features. So each region of this, so let's say we have 16 regions, each region has a local SIF descriptor, which is a bag of words. And our state, phi of s, is this matrix x, which for each row is the bag of words for that region. So we have, we have k regions, we have k rows in our matrix, and each row is the bag of words SIF descriptor for that row, or for that region. And so as the process uh, advances in the acquisition task, these rows are going to one by one get filled up by the regions required, but at first the matrix is completely empty. And so our state representation is just this matrix flattened out into a vector. And our available actions are our k image acquisition actions. So if we have k regions, we start off with k possible image acquisition actions. And as we acquire regions, uh, we're going to decrease the number of that image acquisition actions possible. And then we have our classification actions. And so in certain tasks, we could allow the classifier to classify at any point. So we can actually learn when to stop acquiring and choose to classify. But in this uh, particular paper, we chose to just fix the budget. It's easier to kind of explain the concept. And so these classification actions appear only once you've acquired a certain number of regions. And at that point, we no longer acquire regions and afford to classify. And so here's the policy of how it's defined. So the, the classifier for us is a policy. There's no like policy and then a final classifier. The classifier is the policy. And so the policy is responsible not only for acquisition, but also for the classification of the or labeling them. And so it's a parameterized policy that takes, takes in the state S, so like we saw we have a state descriptor uh, vector, and it outputs an action A. And this action A is either an acquisition action or a labeling action. And so the goal of this policy is to maximize the overall reward. And this is important because we don't have a short-sighted uh, heuristic in terms of choosing the regions, but a long-term uh, goal of getting proper <coughs> classification reward. And so, especially in cases if we have some sort of cost associated with the regions, the classifier is able to make up or learn the trade-off between immediate penalty in terms of acquiring regions and ultimate positive reward in terms of positive, uh, correctly classifying. And so in our case, our reward is actually quite simple. We just project a 0, 1 loss onto the uh, reinforcement learning problem. And so we have 0 in the case of proper classification, which is the 0 penalty and 0, 1 loss in the correct label, and a negative 1 reward, which corresponds to a penalty of 1 on misclassification. And you can kind of show that this basically means that solving this reinforcement learning task is equivalent to solving a classification test. And so in our particular case, where we have a fixed budget, we choose to use a, a slightly more funky policy. So we actually have a, a B sub-policies. So for each stage in the, in the selection process, we have a new sub-policy. So like that, these sub-policies can specialize. And since they're linear, they'll be able to work better on their specific stage in the, in the classification process. And the final sub-policy, we just call it F, to point out the fact that it's kind of the classifier of this process. But in general, you should consider the, the whole policy is both the classifier and the acquisition process. And in a lot of tasks, we actually don't differentiate these. So, like I said, each sub-policy is a classifier in and of itself. And it takes in this feature vector, phi of SA, which is just our phi of S, which was our matrix of apparent, apparent set uh, features, and places it someplace in this big action vector. So it's a very sparse vector. And the state is just offset by which action we're looking at. And we do an art max to find what the best action is for a specific context. So like this, we have a simple linear classifier parameterized by M and B that basically gives us what the best action is to do in a specific context. And so here's kind of an example of how it can work. So we take in, let's say we're on the second step of our classification. We've seen these two regions. And so that this classifier tells us, oh, well, then I should look at the central region of this image. That's the center of our wonderful tower. And then say we have fixed the budget three. So now that we have these three regions, then the classifier is forced to classify, and so it uses the information that it's acquired itself, and then gets the classification label, label tower in this case. And so this is the training. Uh, I'm going to go over really quickly because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. The basic idea is that we just kind of learn the last part of our sub-policies and then propagate backwards. So we learn a final classifier by giving it a bunch of random regions. So let's say our budget's 10. We're going to give it a bunch of 10, set of 10 region samples. And we're going to give it a supervision signal that tells it to classify given a random choice of 10 regions. Then we're going to learn our second to last class of our sub policy that's going to basically take nine regions and find the best complementary 10th region given the nine random regions. We back this up one by one, and each classifier is going to be able to take uh, T regions and find the best T plus first region that's going to allow us to classify uh, the best. And so we do this all the way to the beginning, 
And that gives us the initial classifier, or initial sub-policy, which will be able to find out what's the best initial reason region that I can choose that will allow the rest of my fixed policy chains to classify it uh, in the most performing manner. Um, so it's a, a cast of a policy search by dynamic programming, which is our 2003. We kind of reinvented this in the last of that. So if you're interested in the algorithm, I'd suggest looking at the paper. Um, but it runs really quick, so we only have, instead of running one linear classifier, we just run the linear classifiers. So training isn't that much more helpful. And so here's kind of an example. We have our second to last sub-policy. We give it a random subset of E minus one regions. And then it's going to try to find what's the possible complementary bth region. And for one of the bth regions, so region three, that's going to allow the final step to classify correctly. But for regions 5 and 13, the final step can't classify correctly. So it's going to learn that for this specific subset of P minus 1 region, the best complementary region is region 3. And so like I said, because this is reinforcement learning, uh, because it's reinforcement, reinforcement learning, this is basically allowing us to choose the best region over the long term, and not in terms of some sort of immediate heuristic or some sort of a one-step uh, green policy. And so we ran this on uh, two data sets just to kind of show how it can work. So we have the PPMI data set which is people playing with musical instruments, so they either are playing or aren't playing. And there's 12 binary problems for 12 instruments. And the 15 scenes problem, which is a, just a scene classification problem. And we split our things into 16 regions. This is a mono resolution. We also ran some multi resolution, but it didn't fit into the article. It's already done some as is. And uh, for each region, we just have a SIF bag of words features that is calculated through like standard uh, image tree processing. And like I said, multiple resolutions are possible, but we just do that here. So here's kind of a nice example of how it can work. Obviously, this is one of the nicer ones. Sometimes it's never worse, but sometimes it's just closer. But what you can see here is on the bottom we have percentage of regions. So in terms of 16, so half of the eight, of course, and the accuracy on the left. And so as we sweep the percentage of regions, so we've changed the fixed budget of our classifier. We're going to increase slowly the performance of random subsampling. But we see that our learned subsampling immediately is able to gain more or less acceptable performance. And at the end, of course, we converge, and at the beginning, we converge with standard baseline. So, so we can see we basically have this pocket where when we have very little information, uh, learning it is really important because you're going to sample correctly. And as you get more information, the advantage of learning a policy isn't necessarily all that much. We can also see that in the case of PPMI over the entire data sets, it's actually more, uh, more interesting to not look at your entire image. Because when we have very little information or all the information, we converge with random selection. But in the middle, we're actually able to ignore noise. And so we verified this by just making a static policy where you look at the four middle regions of your, of your image. And since this data set probably has a bias or center on the information, looking at the four middle regions and ignoring the outside of the shell actually gives you the higher accuracy. So if that's the static policy that you define, the system is actually able to find it on its own. And so here's also on 15 scenes. So as you can see, it's always slightly better to learn. It's not always going to give you that huge performance yet. It really depends on the distribution of what the data set is like. And also, you know, how much how much expressivity you want to put your policy. So these are all linear, but you can also kind of make them more complex. And here's an example of regions acquired with a budget of four on the flute data set, trying to see if somebody's playing or not instrument. So you can see that we're always kind of looking at the same region in the bottom left, and there's this fourth region that kind of is different based on the image. And so you can't always interpret what it's doing. But you can at least make a histogram. And so on the left is B equals four, and on the right is B equals eight. And so we can see that if we're only using four regions, these bottom two left regions are really, really used a lot. But if we allow the system to use eight regions, actually that far left region isn't considered as important because it's able to spread out the information more and it chooses to look further. So uh, this is you know, kind of some intuition we can pick up out of the system. Uh, of course, it's you know, always hard to understand exactly what's going on. But um, that's some of how it works. So there's a little bit more work on multi-resolution and learn budget. Uh, especially getting the budget to learn more quick, because if you want to learn to stop, you can do it, you've done it, but your training algorithm starts something gets a lot more complex, because you have to not only learn what to choose, but also when to classify. And uh, some stuff just talking with people yesterday that seemed interesting would be uh, either object detection, and also video classification, so not only do, can you move uh, in space to look, you can also move in time, to try to find key frames that might have the most information available. So uh, hopefully this can be helpful for some people. It definitely is like a, a nice way to avoid involving over all your information, and you're definitely going to find at least a better than random policy, um, and sometimes actually quite a good policy to look for information, not only in images, but actually in any sort of a, a tutorial or, or any kind of structured data set. So uh, thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, uh, go ahead.
some explanation is very good. Question? I have a few questions. So you're you're using a fixed budget mm -hmm. and you're treating it as an MVP. I guess one way to think about what you're doing is really to frame it as a POM MVP, right? Because you're you're deciding where to look or you can think of them as information gathering actions. Correct. Sure. So have you thought about so we've never really used the POM MVP proposal that much. We're much more into the idea of having all the hidden state appear in the classifiers and generalization of the states. And so it's kind of like a different approach. It's probably less common in the literature, but uh, easier to, for us to understand in terms of mixing machine learning and MVP. So it's less formal, but it seems to scale up there. And did you experiment with putting a cost associated with gathering? Right. So actually, my thesis is all about this sorts of problems and all sorts of data sets. And so we have all sorts of constraints. And probably the most simple to understand cost based data set would be a medical diagnosis data set where you have costs associated with different features, and you're actually going to find a sort of uh, doctor policy, which is how to ask questions, and based on the answers you get, should I dig deeper and find you know, what you're sick, or should I just stop right away and not, not tell them? So I'll say not sick. And actually did it on MNIST with cost, and you can see that uh, simple digits such as 1 and 2 are quickly classified with their proper class, but more complicated to distinguish digits such as 5 and 8 will actually be more deeply introspective and uh, spend more time. 